Question five, blah, blah, blah. Because back then, they had to try and find questions that were relevant to real life situations. So here we go. There's a road around the side of the loch, and of course that'll be modelled by some exact, simple, cubic expression. Indeed, blah, 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 this is where it actually works. Right down, it tells you that, the very last line, here it is. The point A where X is negative 2 and the line AB is a tangent to A. Déjà vu, write down the coordinates of A. Find the equation of the line AB. Have we not seen that before somewhere? Question 3. Cubic, cubic. Find the equation. 5 marks get the equation of the tangent. Question 5. 5 marks get the equation of the tangent. And what's going on here? 2's. Question 3. Find the equation of the tangent at the point where x is 2. Oh no. Question 5. Get the equation of the tangent to a very similar curve, only here x is negative 2. Oh, silly me. Totally different. Right, off we go again. A. Write down the coordinates of A. So, substitute it in. Well, if x is negative 2, that means y is going to be negative 2 cubed minus 9 times negative 2, which is going to give you then 10. So A is the point, negative 2, 10. Second bit. Find the equation of the line AB, which is the tangent. Right, so I'll differentiate it. dy by dx will be 3x squared minus 9. If x is negative 2, that means the gradient will be given by the derivative at that point, which will be 3 times negative 2 squared minus 9, and that's going to be 3 times 4 minus 9, which is 3. Which means the equation of the line AB, have I got room to write it in here if I write smaller? So I've got y minus b is mx minus a. I should really be writing smaller on the wee board like this. So I've got y minus the 10 is 3 times x. Take away the negative 2. I'll just put lazy and put plus 2. So that, I'll just stick it over here. So that I can get this in its simple form, because everything's going to be integers. So I can put it in that preferred form, y equals. Perfect for substitution and know what the line looks like. y equals 3x plus 6 plus 10. 16. And there's another 5 marks again. So, part B then. Determine the coordinates of the point B, the intersection of the line and the curve. We'll not just do one of them. Still, I suppose this will be different. Give them names, because I'm just about to equate them or substitute them. To get the point B, I'll say this. When you substitute, I think that one instead of that, substitute 1 in 2. So, I've got x cubed minus 9x is 3x plus 16. Take it over to one side. x cubed minus, there's no x squared, so minus 12x minus 16 equals 0. So factorising that will give me the, the answers I'm looking for. So, well, I'm not guessing in the dark here. I already know two of the answers here. Because since that's a point, that's a point of tangency, it means there's a double root there and there's only one factor left. And I know that happened at negative 2. So I already know two of the factors of that. It's going to be x plus 2, x plus 2, and then x something else, which will give me that b. I'll put down the synthetic division anyway. So I've got 1, no x squared term, negative 12, negative 16. And I know that negative 2 works. 1, negative 2, negative 2, 4, negative 8, 16. No surprise, 0. So the remainder of 0 means that x minus 2, sorry, x plus 2 is a factor. So I've got x plus 2, and the remaining factor is this part, x squared minus 2x minus 8 equals 0. So it's going to be x plus 2, and that must be x times x. And I've got 2 times 4. And I've got the negative going to the bigger one. And then it says they're the opposite. But I knew they were the same anyway. Which gives me the two answers. A double root at 2. Or a single root at 4. Which means that b must be at 4. x equals 2 at a. Which means x equals 4 at b. And this is the case of what's the y coordinate. Substitute it back in. So, x equals 4 in equation 2 gives me 
y is 3 times 4 plus 16. So I've got the 12, 12 and 16, that's going to be 28. Finish it off. B is the point 4, 28. And that's question 5. Question 6. Circles. Ah, well, so many get scared by circles, especially a big dagger on like that. There's this shape called an arbolo. Doesn't mention that, does it? There's a semicircle, and then there's two smaller semicircles which fit neatly inside it. And no, nothing to do with Batman, this one. So, part A. Oh, going to run out there. Find the equation of the circle center A. Now, forget the rest of the diagram and concentrate on just this part. That's just a little circle on its own. I know two diametrically opposite points on it. So forget the rest of the shape. It's just I want the equation of a circle, you want the center and its radius. Well, you could get the radius by taking half the diameter, and I know those numbers, or you can get the radius from the center to the outside. Well, first of all, it's just going to be what's the center. Well, that's the midpoint. So it's halfway between those. So just take the average of the coordinates. Negative 1 plus the 2 upon 2, and 2 plus the 4 upon 2, whoops, for the y coordinates. So the point A is going to be the point a half. That's going to be a bit of a pest when it comes to working out the radius. But the other bit's easy, that's 3. So the centre of the circles is at a half 3. And when it comes to working out the radius, I could work it out directly, but I've got that half, or I could work out this one, but that's worse because I've got to half it anyway. I'll probably just do that. So I'll just work out the distance from A to E. So I'll just call that R. So the radius is going to be the square root of, unless I keep the square there to save me writing the square root of, the difference in the x-coordinates and the difference in the y-coordinates squared between the two points. So it's going to be 2, I'll put this one in, a half 3, it's going to be 2 take away a half, squared, and the difference in the y-coordinates, 4 take away 3, squared. Well, that's the easy one, that's 1 squared, that's just going to be 1. So that's 1 upon half. 1.5, 3 upon 2, squared, 9 upon 4. So altogether that's going to be another 4, that's going to be 13 upon 4. And in fact, that's all you want. You don't want to know what the radius is. It's the square that you want. So the square is 13 upon 4, which means for part A, the equation of the circle will be x minus a squared, y minus b squared equals r squared. x minus a half squared plus y minus 3 squared is 13 upon 4. Which we'll probably do. It's just I don't quite like that because of the fractions. So I might be tempted to multiply that out and see if I can tidy it up. I could you'd probably just leave that and that'd be an answer. I'll just multiply it out. What have I got? So I've got square the first, square the say, double twice the product, that's nice and easy. Square the last, a bit nasty. This one's alright. Square the first, twice the product. Square the last, that's okay. And that was just 13 upon 4. And then I was tempted, first of all, to say everything times 4, but that quarter can come across, knock off one of them, makes it a 12, 4 goes in, that's 3, everything's nice and neat. And you've got x squared plus y squared minus x minus 6y. That became, one over that, taking away that quarter, made that whole thing into a 3. Take the 3 over and subtract it from the 9, plus 6 equals 0. And that was part A. Though you could just have stopped there, probably. But I didn't like the fractions, so I went to that. So part B. Now, there's another circle. The circle with centre B. So forget the rest of the diagram. Let's just concentrate on that circle centre B. Here's its equation. And I know one of the points in the circumference is E, the other point is F. Well, I can get the centre straight away. That point's going to be half of those negative... 8, 8. In fact, that's what it asks for, doesn't it? Write down the coordinates of B. Easy. Next part. Determine the coordinates of F and C. Well, F next, because if that's the centre, the distance from A to B, I may as well put that in now, that's 8, 8. However far you go travelling from E to B, that directed line segment, it'll be the same again to go from B to F. And you could also just do that in your head here. Does it just say write down? It says determine. Because going from E to B, it's 2 to 8 is 6 along, 4 to 8 is 4 up. It's 6 along, 4 up. So going from B to F will also be 6 along, 4 up. Or will I factor, will I formalise that? I think I will. How do you travel from E to B? 
Well, that's going to be b minus a. So it's going to be 8, 8 minus 2, 4. So that's it formalised then. So that's going to give you that 6, 4. So how can you find the position of f? It'll just be make the same move from c. So that f is just going to be starting at b, 8 plus the 6 and 8 plus the 4. Because it was 6 along, 4 up. So it'll be another 6 along, 6 onto the x-coordinate and 4 up, 4 onto the y-coordinate. Which means f is going to be the point 14, 12. So we've got that, f is 14, 12. What else did it want? It wanted the coordinates of C. Now C was the centre of the big circle. Well now I know the points it goes through. It goes through D and F. F was 14, 12. So C is going to be the midpoint of DF. So it's the average of the coordinates. So negative 1 plus 14, that's a bit awkward, and 2 plus 12, that's a bit nicer. So C is going to be the point then, we'll do the same one first, that's 14, so that's going to be 7. But that's not, so that's 13 upon 2, will I write 13 upon 2, will I write 6 and a half? I'm not sure which I'll put down. I'll put 6 and a half. Part C. In the diagram, the perimeter of the shape is represented by the thick black line. Obviously, because that's the line that goes round the outside. So you have to work out that perimeter. Well, you've got three semicircles. To get the distance round a semicircle, that semicircular arc is half of the circumference. It's a half of pi d. So that means it's half of d is pi r. So I need three radii. Well, I know the radius of that one, because r squared was 13 upon 4. I could have had that while I was doing the centre. I should have done that straight away. So I had 8, 8 for the centre. So the radius is going to be, because you just use these figures, you might as well work this out whether you need it or not, it would be 8 squared plus 8 squared minus 76. So that's going to be 64 and 64 is 128. Take away 76 is 52. I'll call that R2. Then the radius of the big one <coughs> is simply the two of those added together. The diameter and the diameter makes the big diameter, which means halving it all, the radius and the radius makes the big radius. So then, to work out the perimeter, I'm going to have this. The perimeter is pi r, so the perimeter is going to be pi r1 for that distance, pi r2 for that distance, and then pi times the sum of them, r1 plus r2. Well, that's just the same thing as that. So if I take out these factors, what I've got is this. I've got that doubled, take out the pi. So I've got 2 pi times r1 plus r2. I've got 2 pi times root 52, and this one's going to be root 13 upon 4. So I'll we'll just put it down that way. I've got root 13 upon 4 plus root 52. Or maybe you'd kept it all separate and had the other extra wee bits. So that's 2 pi times. How do you tidy that up? Well, luckily, that's a 4 times 32, so that's a 2 root 13. And take the 4, the square root of the 4, that's a half root 13. <coughs> so that's 2 and a half root 13, so that's 5 up and 2 root 13. I'll oh, spell it out first. So that's a half of root 13 plus 2 lots of root 13. So you could think taking the root 13s out as a common factor. I'll be left with 2 and a half, which is 5 up and 2. So it's 2 pi times 5 up and 2, which then just gives me, whoops, look at the 2s, 5 pi root 13 as required. Number 7, part A. Let's take a look at that, I think. Wave function. It's in degrees. Notice the mean degrees signs. I tend not to put them in, which makes it a lot easier. So, first part. Show that that can be expressed in the form of. Well, that's not as trivial as it sounds, and determine the values of A. I think you're just going to interpret that as let it be expressed in the form of. Hence, find the values of k and alpha. So, we're going to let that equal k cos x plus alpha. But I'm not going to put the degree signs after this. Which means it will be k times cos x cos alpha minus sine x sine alpha. Or that will be k cos alpha as the coefficient of cos x minus k sine alpha as the coefficient of sine x. And then you can equate the coefficients. 
because if the two sides are meant to be the same, then the coefficients of cos x must be the same, and the coefficients of sine x must be the same. So equating the coefficients, I've got this. I've got k cos alpha equals 2, and k sine alpha, just be careful with the signs of it, it says negative 3, it says negative that, so that just equals the 3 part of it. So I've got two simultaneous equations to solve. The technique is to get rid of the k's, <coughs> sorry, to get rid of the alphas, the sines and the cosines, you square them and add them. So I'll have k squared equals 2 squared plus 3 squared, 4 plus 9 equals 13. Well, there we go again, eh? Quite a few repetitions in the paper there, so the old root 13 reappearing just after the last question. And then dividing the two equations in the order of 2 divided by 1, I'll have sine over cos, which means tan alpha will be 3 upon 2. So alpha is going to be the inverse tan of 3 upon 2. And just as a quick check, they're both positive. The cosine's positive, the sine's positive, so it's going to be between 0 and 90 for this one. So you do inverse tan of 3 upon 2, so blah, blah, so 56.3 degrees. So that's the first part. So part B, find the maximum and minimum. Now, a cosine looks like this. Not this particular one, because that's been shifted back 56 degrees. You don't need to differentiate. You know when that cosine's at its maximum minimum. It's the maximum at 0, or 360, the minimum at 180. And unless it's been shifted up or down, but there isn't anything extra like a 2 plus it. So that to get the maximum, you can state it straight away. So the maximum value is going to be root 13, and that's going to happen when the angle x plus 56.3 equals 0. Now that means I'm going to have to take that away, that would give me a negative answer. And it says it wants the answers between 0, so I'll take the next one. So when that angle equals 360. So that means x is going to be 360, take away that. I'll write it down, 360 minus 56.3, so that's going to be the 303.7. That's the first part. Maximum is 13, when x is 303.7. And similarly for the minimum, the minimum will be negative root 13 because it goes up and down by the same amount. Only with a cosine, it's at its minimum when the angle is 180. So that's going to happen when x plus 56.3 equals 180. So x is going to be 180 minus 56.3, which means that x is going to be 123.7. So minimum when x equals oh, 123.7. Now, part C, one mark. Write down the minimum value of this. f of x squared. Well, there's two ways you could do it. You could square that. That would be 13 cos squared. But cos squared, the graph of cos squared would look like this. If that's a graph of cos, cos squared means all the negative values would be positive values, it'll end up looking like this. A square of something can't be negative, so the minimum value must be zero. So you can just answer it from that. It's going to vary between zero and 13, but don't ask for the maximum, just ask for the minimum. So for that one, for that, the minimum value is going to be, does it ask when it happens? No, just the value. The minimum will be zero. And that's question seven.